we have um, Professor Sundar Sarutkai uh, today um, on uh, to, to be you know, talking about uh, inequities in the production of uh, social knowledge. So I'll, I'll take a minute to introducing Sundar and hand it over to Professor Sundar. Um, Sundar Sarukai works primarily in the philosophy of the natural and the social sciences. He was professor of philosophy at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, NIAS, until 2019, and was also the founder director of the Manipal Center for Philosophy and Humanities. He is the author of the following books, Translating the World, Science and Language, Philosophy of Symmetry, Indian Philosophy and Philosophy of Science, What is Science, J.R.D. Tata and the Ethics of Philanthropy, and two books co-authored with uh, Gopal Guru, The Cracked Mirror, an Indian Debate on Experience and Theory and Experience, Caste and the Everyday Social. His most recent book, um, The Social Life of Democracy. Um, his efforts to take philosophy to the public uh, have led to a book for children titled Philosophy for Children, Thinking, Reading and Writing, uh, published in multiple languages, uh, English and many of the Indian languages, as well as a recently released uh, philosophical novel, Following a Prayer. Uh, he's a series editor of uh, Rotary's uh, Science and Technology Studies, as well as the co-chief editor of the Springer Handbook on Logical Thought in India. So this is a, uh, I mean, we are uh, expecting uh, a discussion that is um, very different from the kinds of discussion that we have had uh, over the last um, uh, you know, uh, talks. Uh, uh, so without um, taking much time uh, between you and uh, the audience, Sundar, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, so it's about, uh, about 40 to 45 minutes, five, five, 10 minutes here and there. And after that, we will take uh, Q&A and, and the discussions. Over to you, Sundar. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Srinidhi. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Abba, for getting in touch with me about this. Uh, it's a, I've heard, of course, much about your organization, and it is wonderful to have an opportunity to share some of my ideas with you. There is, um, although, and I think I must add along with what Srinidhi said, uh, I, I think there are points which I'll be talking about, which may not be in your usual domain of interest. But um, these are questions which many of us have been thinking about for quite some time uh, in the larger context of what is it to study societies, what is the function of social sciences in India and so on. In particular, um, when I was in uh, Manipal, I had the opportunity to be engaged uh, more with the, the medical community running medical ethics course and my engagement with the public health programs there. And uh, through this, I had some inkling of the kinds of challenges and questions that these practices throw up for us as quote unquote theoreticians or people who want to uh, think about and discourse and create uh, theories and narratives about the nature of social reality in India. So I'm going to um, share a PowerPoint. So we'll have some idea of um, just a second so that you can follow some of the things which I want to say. and. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I particularly chose this topic of the production of social knowledge as a fundamental problem, the site of a particular problem in the study of social sciences in India. What I mean, I'll explain what I mean by social knowledge as we go along. But the basic idea is this, that the very way by which we produce ideas about the nation, about people in it, about communities, about narratives of what constitutes health and well-being are being in, in themselves, in the very intrinsic nature of the production, there can be inequities which creep into it. In fact, creep, I'm, I'm trying to be very polite and say uh, they might creep into it. People would argue that the way the structures of producing knowledge are inher inherently produce inequities. So I want to open this out as a discussion rather than a statement from my side. So I'd be very happy to you know, get your feedback, your responses, and even challenges to this particular position. So uh, let me first begin with the simple argument. Why do I want to talk about knowledge? Because the idea of knowledge is very closely linked to action. So while I, I will begin with a little bit of background from philosophy, and I'm sure and not as a discipline, but as a general idea, which many of your 
perhaps all of you have a good idea about. The reason why I focus on knowledge is uh, because one, of course, it's a very important subset of what we do in philosophy, the whole study of theories of knowledge under the domain called epistemology. But more important for our con con context today, the reason why knowledge, the, the category of knowledge is important is because much of our action depends on knowledge. If I want to take a particular action on what I want to do, how I want to do something, it depends on the domain of knowledge that I possess and the domain of uh, various other kinds of things which I need to know, including you know, knowledge of how things are, knowledge how to do things and so on. So we know that in general for each one of us in our own personal lives, individual actions, we do depend deeply upon some idea of knowledge. And in the, same, uh, in the same spirit, I want to extend that argument to suggest that any kind of social action uh, depends on some idea of social knowledge. And I, I, I want to keep the idea of social knowledge comparatively vague right now. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what it is so in, in the sense I want, I'm using it here. But the simple argument here is that any action that you do vis-a-vis -a, -vis a community and society, including public health initiatives, which are fundamentally about the social communities, those kind of actions depend upon what kind of knowledge domains that we possess, what kind of quote unquote social knowledge is needed for uh, making meaningful actions in that. And therefore, um, and this is something which all of you who are involved in this field know this very well that public health measures, particularly in the larger context of the way in which we talk about health, in which we talk about health of communities and groups and societies are dependent and uh, are, are based upon various kinds of knowledge, whether they can range from uh, medical knowledge, can range to knowledge about how individuals behave under certain contexts, like saying, you know, Indians won't wear masks, for example, you know, various kinds of beliefs and opinions one has about the larger community we work with. So the simple question I want to engage with here is that what kind of social knowledge is required to perform meaningful social action? So in other words, what is it that I need to equip myself with if I'm going to intervene in society, if I'm going to make changes in society, if I'm going to um, you know, demand certain things of a people who constitute the society? And the first simple a uh, question which I want to get rid of so that there's no ambiguity in what I mean by the word knowledge. So let me very quickly uh, give you a simple uh, way in which I, we would consider it, what uh, knowledge is from you know, various theories of knowledge. The first reason why knowledge as a category is very important uh, is because it, there are many kinds of states that we have, what you would call as mental states. I may have an opinion about something, I may have belief, I may have guesses, I may, I may even make the right guess about something, but it does not mean that I know something. I may have a right belief about something. For example, I might believe the earth goes around the sun much before, let's say, Copernicus and Galileo and theories of that, but that does not make it knowledge. So there is something which we think is special to the idea of knowledge. And a lot of work in epistemology and theories of knowledge is just to try and give you detailed account of what constitutes knowledge. And the, far, the quickest way for me to uh, give you a very quick bird's eye view of how one approaches this question is to say that, well, knowledge is, is, is a mental state, is a kind of a mental place, like to know is, to, is, a, is a mental state just like to guess, to believe, uh, to opine, etc. But what separates knowledge from these other kinds of uh, states is that there is some notion of justifiability to them. And there are various ways in which you can look at what is meant by justified and justifiable, but the larger context is something which can be justified. So just to say that I believe the earth goes around the sun um, does not become a piece of knowledge until I justify it in some sense. So there is a particular jump between the uh, positions of having opinions and beliefs to some to a state of what we would call as knowledge. And because of the a very intrinsic definition of justification, they are related to things, to concepts such as truth, reality, uh, state of affairs, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is the way, you know, very briefly and very quickly, um, philosophy would try and make sense of what, what is so special about the idea of knowledge. But one thing which interests me enormously, particularly in the context of the social sciences and the natural sciences also, is that uh, the production of knowledge, when we when we produce certain things called knowledge, they are often 
not just about going and doing something in the world, observing something. All those, all those are important. But equivalently, what is also important is that new concepts are created to describe realities. These realities could be natural realities or social realities. So we keep, you know, there's something very interesting about the human mind. It keeps producing concepts and categories all the time. We tend to put things within families and groups. Um, in, in, in and that's part of the way in which we understand a very basic idea of cognition. So I want to keep that in the background because that becomes very important when you go and engage with groups in the world. Because we go, when we engage with communities in the world, in the society outside us, we are often influenced by the concepts and categories we hold about them. Right. So these are very important general ideas of the uh, question of knowledge. And the problem is actually because it, it's very difficult to give just one universal theory of what knowledge is because there are very many different types of knowledge systems. It, or every discipline has its own domain of spe specialized knowledge systems. So whether it's ranges from philosophy, mathematics, etc., uh, even to questions of religious knowledge, folk systems, medical systems, and so on, including literature, uh, arts, all of them have <clears throat> certain domain of articulation, certain domains of claims within those systems, which they would see as knowledge, which they see as justified within themselves. Uh, you can see I'm saying all this as um, to come to our larger question, which will be my last slide when we talk about the questions of medical science and the different medical systems that, they are, that, there are that, that are present and the challenges in making sense of the knowledge claims of different medical systems. Now, what do I then mean by social knowledge? Again, very quickly, uh, just it's a term I'm using to suggest certain kinds of things. It, it makes it easy for me to talk about what I want to talk about. So first of all, knowledge about societies, is, um, which includes various skins, is not just about society, but many kinds of social processes. You could have, for example, the, the knowledge about how caste functions, how religious organizations work together, how gender functions within, within societies, and so on. But you, it, it's a very broad category in the way I'm using it here for my purposes, and it includes many different things. It includes not just um, a larger study of society, which it also includes its institutions, a, a sociological study of its institutions, which means you have, you will describe, um, you know, educational institutions, legal institutions, how things which, um, you know, the police system works, etc. All kinds of social organizations. But it also in, uh, refers to a large uh, extent about understanding communities and practices of communities, uh, belief systems of communities, various practices, cultural practices and social practices of individual groups and communities in general. Anything which forms what we might loosely call as social. And of course, you know, um, as uh, Srinidhi was saying, one of uh, my books with uh, Gopal Guru is uh, called the caste everyday, uh, you know, experience caste and everyday social, where we explore the I, the concept of the social itself and show how difficult it is to really uh, historically how difficult it has been to conceptualize and define with any clarity what the concept social actually means. So the word social is used very broadly, but it can have, you know, it, it needs to be unpacked in every different context. But I also want to use social knowledge to refer to something uh, of knowledge which is present in the social domain among the people, something which is there socially accessible, okay? Not as expert domain knowledge, but as knowledge which is present across uh, varieties of people. Now, this and many other ways of looking at social knowledge are important for us because as I first began, I said knowledge influences action. So all these kinds of knowledge about these social processes, entities, knowledge present it within people, available as socially, all of them influence social action, um, you know, all kinds of processes which deal with that. And this kind of knowledge is unique compared to other kinds of knowledge. And I think again, public health in bringing the question of medical science and the social sciences together in a very unique way, uh, it's something which, as I said, that's one of the reasons why as a discipline, it interests me uh, because there are a lot of inherent tensions within it because there are different types of knowledge systems which, which are the basis of what we call as knowledge science uh, paradigms and the social science paradigms. 
and some of the uniqueness of the social knowledge in principle are something which again something which all of you would have engaged with in different ways but for completeness let me list it here now while we look at the questions of knowledge in modern disciplines we recognize that there are some dominant models um, you know what constitutes knowledge what should be an ideal model of knowledge and uh, typically as we know um, in variety especially in something called as a science there are models which is which could be axiomatic logical mathematical etc which may form the basis of what you might call as the structure of knowledge within whatever you call as a science whether the natural or the social sciences and within the sciences itself um, there are there is it, it represents a different kind of uh, knowledge um, both the, the knowledge within the sciences is different from the knowledge within mathematics but i mean although mathematics and sciences are so deeply related the nature of knowledge in both of them are actually quite different one is formal the other is empirical but still this kind of models of there are these kinds of dominant models of knowledge whenever we talk of any kind of knowledge production in the natural and the social sciences but there are some major differences too and i'll just talk about one and i'm sure you've talked you know you're aware of various other kinds of challenges you have when you talk about uh, social knowledge the the basic simple uh, problem from which arise other kinds of problems is the fact that the objects of study that which you describe that which you whose phenomena you explain are humans and not inanimate nature so if the natural sciences are supposed to produce knowledge about nature and the natural phenomena whatever whatever you understand as nature then in the case of social knowledge the fundamental difference is that the objects of study are uh, are uh, completely different in in a way, in in many ways i will just um, uh, you know implicate a couple of points about that because i want to look at just one particular point which is of relevance for us today one is that uh, one is the nature of the knowledge itself which i want to talk about but i'll talk more about the next three points one which is the situatedness of the person who knows the local contextual uh, aspect of social science social knowledge what i mean by that is uh, unlike the natural sciences where you one would believe that a scientist's position location their social position their position as an individual their cognitive capacities if you like are not will do not reflect upon the nature of truth about nature for example uh, if i uh, a scientific idea let's say the earth is going around the sun becomes a, a species of knowledge a knowledge claim and articulation of knowledge independent of who that person is who the scientist is it is um, a kind of a description of a particular natural phenomena in social knowledge and in descriptions of social knowledge in production of social knowledge the larger question which has become very important even uh, particularly today is about the location of the person who is producing that knowledge it becomes it seems that it is becoming more difficult to actually remove the situatedness away from uh, the claim that is being made in other words when a person is producing a piece of knowledge the question which we have to confront and answer however much we may think for some it may not make sense is that uh, whether this cultural social and other contextual uh, context which define the person who is producing the knowledge influences what knowledge is being produced okay influences the content of that knowledge um i'm just going to give one example of it as we go along but i want to uh, want to keep this in the back of our minds um as a one important challenge to um, you know in the way in which we understand social knowledge and um, a very important implication of the social knowledge again is the fact that the question of ethics and morality become central you cannot escape that it becomes uh, integral to the ideas of social knowledge itself I, i i think this is an important point because you know one of the ways by which we understand the nature of natural science knowledge or knowledge within the natural sciences is that they are not there is nothing morally right or wrong about the statement of knowledge in the natural sciences there is nothing morally right or wrong that the earth is going around the sun for example or 2 plus 2 equal to 4 you see them as facts as against um you know as against knowledge within the social domain which are not which cannot be reduced to such simplistic facts 
even a simple fact of saying something about a person is already morally loaded. Saying something about a society under the guise of fact, like in the natural sciences, is, is a big problem in the social sciences because um, the implication of this fact uh, the fact value dichotomy, which has a long history in, within philosophy, uh, which which grounds the natural sciences is not possible in the social sciences. And these questions become particularly um, important in the context of India, as we will see as we go along. Now, why then would I uh, use this kind of uh, structure of social knowledge? Why do we produce knowledge about societies and other people? Because like we do with the sciences within the larger framework of the sciences, knowledge is used to intervene, change, progress, rectify, do anything, any kind of process of reordering the society, you need to have the idea of knowledge. You use knowledge as a way in which you intervene in society, in which you intervene in people. You use these ideas of knowledge, for example, even you know, almost all public health paradigms are based on that. What do you think people should do and why they should do it? And therefore, these are um, these actually function within the social sciences as what I often call as uh, the technology of the social sciences. There's actually a very interesting technological domain within the social sciences, just like there is a technological domain within the natural sciences. Now, having given this as a background to what we understand as uh, you know social knowledge and some of the problems associated with it, let me look at the specific point which I suggest in this uh, talk, which is about the nature of production of that knowledge. So. My argument is that the very act of producing that knowledge raises certain fundamental inequities which arise within this act of production. So let them, let's look at how are this social knowledge actually produced. In a sense, it is like the natural science knowledge or a scientific knowledge in the larger framework of the natural and the social science. There is of course an empirical component which is very important. And this is what distinguishes scientific knowledge from mathematical knowledge. Mathematical knowledge is formal as something which is really not, does not need the empirical to ground what it says. Whereas uh, for the natural sciences, the very idea of a science is to be engaged with this question of what we call as empirical sciences, to make sense of phenomena around us, to make sense of natural and social phenomena. And of course, we know how to do it. And therefore, there are many different ways of doing it. I'm just giving you one particular uh, argument for this. So it's a limited to certain aspects, but you know, this is what you would do, for example, if you study, read philosophy of science, to look at each one of these components in great detail to see how, what, what does it mean to have empirical knowledge, etc. But in general, within the context of social knowledge, so there is uh, the idea of social, the, the, the way social knowledge is produced in our engagement with society, with our empirical engagement with society, is not just through observation, uh, analysis, etc. But as many of you who may know from people who are, come from studied social sciences and anthropology and sociology, for example, know about techniques such as participant observation, uh, interpretation, what we call as hermeneutics, um, which is you know a larger interpretative framework to make sense of what society uh, is, what kind of social reality, how can I describe the social reality around me? And there are these are all well-established ways, um, much debated, but they, are, they have produced an enormous amount of knowledge about societies. But the question still remains, and I think has become, as I said, more prominent in recent decades, is um, whether all this knowledge is produced by others and knowledge about the social world is based, is biased by the particular framework or particular viewpoint or the standpoint of certain people who produce this knowledge. So is it, um, uh, is there, is it possible to have a God's eye image like you believe in natural sciences, something outside all human interests and producing the knowledge of the social world, of the natural world? Is it possible for um, humans to be outside all human interests, okay, and human belongingness in various ways to produce knowledge about the society around them? And that's a legitimate question. It's a question which has been addressed and we know some ways to respond to it in different ways. But along with the empirical, to the, as means to produce social knowledge, you also need other kinds of things. One of the most important um, ideas, which are, you know, as I, I place it under origins, but the question of experience is of course related closely to the empirical, but I, I place it under origins just to show that typically if you ask ourselves, 
um, you know, where did we get our knowledge of the societies we want to study? Where do we get the knowledge of society in which we intervene? Let's say as public health specialists, then one could say that it comes from experience of particular kinds. And uh, it also comes from various other accounts, what are called testimonies, book texts, et cetera. It comes from a huge amount of social theory, which has been produced in so many different ways in so many different countries, et cetera. So we have some idea of saying that, well, these are the ways by which knowledge is produced. And, um, you know, so once you have that kind of a framework, then we can really situate what the problem in production of the social knowledge is and, uh, for, and, and, and to discover ways of responding to some of them. So the first point um, to understand why there is a fundamental difference um, in, the, in the production of knowledge about societies as against nature, for example, is that um, you know, there is, there's a very important feedback mechanism between the objects of study and the people who study it. So if I am a so-called sociologist or anthropologist who's studying communities and writing about them, then in principle, in principle, but may not be true in practice, in principle, I produce knowledge about a society which they can question, which they can say, hey, I don't know what you have written about me. I don't accept anything that you say about me, right? Whereas when you produce natural knowledge, let's say I'm a physicist talking about the way the world is, uh, you know, the earth goes around the sun or whatever, then the objects of study are mute. They are not in a position to tell me directly in some sense. So here already I'm signaling there are other ways in which that will happen. If my theory is wrong, I know observations are wrong, et cetera. But here I'm signaling as a very important methodological problem that, you know, that the objects of study have a way to give a very active feedback and it's related a very important question about language. The second problem is that in principle, as a, as a concept, as a particular kind of an idea, a category called knowledge. Knowledge is not democratic. Um, there are various ways of understanding this, um, but you know, so it, it very, one way in which you can understand uh, the non-democratic aspect of knowledge or the undemocratic aspect of knowledge is through its far more powerful uh, slogan associated with various uh, thinkers, including Foucault and others, which is knowledge is power. It's something which is so much of a common folk wisdom. And you possess knowledge, you possess power. Um, and power, of, of course, always is something which is in a, always in attention with the question of democracy. Now, this is actually very important because in my last book on the social life of democracy, one of the criticisms I have about theories of democracy is that the theories of democracies produced by academics around the world actually are things which are completely alienated, which are ignored by the people who actually participate in democracy. And that leads to a very important, you know, fundamental problem with the idea of democracy in societies. But uh, that is one point which I want to keep in the back of the mind. And finally, to the idea that I've been working with, the people who produce the knowledge are also, in essence, producing, bringing in the social inequities which characterize their position into the knowledge that they produced. One way of uh, uh, one way of um, you know articulating this is to say, well, um, in the way in which we are structured our society today is a group of people produces knowledge, right? And we are all part of it. I mean, all of us who are here today, for example, are part of it. And we produce knowledge because we have certain capacities. We've been trained in particular ways. We have read certain things, and we think that has given us a particular way to understand societies around us, upon which, based upon which. Government policies are made, policies which um, which range from, you know, whether a, whether a community should have a road or whether they should all get inoculated or whether whatever should happen are all uh, driven by the kind of knowledge uh, pr which is held and produced within particular societies. You know, Gopal Guru, who, with whom I wrote these two books, a uh, very important political philosopher and political scientist in India, in one of his uh, pieces, uh, uh, talks about a very important problem in the social sciences in India. And it was that piece which triggered our collaboration and which, which led to our book, The Cracked Mirror. And in that, uh, uh, in that piece, which he published in EPW, he talks, about, he coins a, a phrase called the empirical shudras and theoretical Brahmins. He was actually asking the question 
about a particular, actually pointing to a particular problem in Indian social sciences uh, in this production of social knowledge when he said that who is writing about the Dalit community? And his problem, he begins with a particular formulation of the problem of Dalit communities and the articulation of them by mainstream Indian social science or by sociologists and political scientists and historians and others. And he makes a, you know, what, what became a very um, contentious point, which is what led to various kinds of debates and our book was, uh, his argument was that, uh, why is it that only forward castes are writing about Dalits in Indian social science? What is it that they are doing in terms of who is theorizing about the Dalit experience? Uh, it's not being the Dalits because Dalits have not been part of the Indian social science community, uh, which needed these kinds of certain kinds of theoretical capabilities in order to produce that knowledge, which is legitimized as mainstream social science knowledge. And as I said, that the very catchy phrase called empirical shudras and theoretical brahmins, what you are suggesting actually, more importantly, is to raise the question between the position of the knowledge producer and the people with whom it is being produced and the people about whom we produce these narratives and discourses and knowledge claims. And um, so one way to ask that question, you know, the first yeah, response to this would be to say, well, you know, everything is an object of study. I can do it objectively. It does not matter who I am and that I should be a member of a particular community to talk about that community. I'm just doing what a scientist does. But as I pointed out earlier, there are very intrinsic problems within the idea of social knowledge that might make us question this assumption. More importantly, one of the other ways in which you could phrase this question and it's a question which I find very useful to phrase even in my discussions with my students and others is to ask, why do we produce the knowledge that we produce? Why am I interested in studying a particular community? Why am I actually thinking what is good for them and what is not good for them? When I'm saying why, uh, by asking that, I'm not saying we shouldn't. And obviously uh, that may negate a lot of other kinds of interventions we can do, even within oppressive systems or, uh, you know, marginalized systems and so on. But the, this is the larger theoretical question. How do we understand this question of why am I even producing um, these kinds of questions? Uh, one way to re-look at that question is as a problem of intentionality, is, is to ask the question of what is your intentions because you want be wanting to study a Dalit community in Maharashtra? You know, and why am I producing the kind of structures? It, it, is, not, it is not important whether they are positive points or negative points, that's not the point. The larger question is the situatedness of the local context dependence of the producer of knowledge raises certain important questions, more important. So keeping aside the why question. So let's assume that uh, intentionality is very good or whatever it is, whatever that means, we should ask a more fundamental question. What should be the conditions that you should have before I can say something about another society, about other people? Before, before, because based upon what I say and think and believe about other community, I'm actually intervening in them. Whether it's the larger questions of medical or non, is not the important, or qu larger questions of development, for example. That's not the question. The larger, I think the question which is of interest, which makes the very idea of social knowledge something within the uh, domain of ethics, is to ask, what do you expect of me? What should I know as a social scientist? before I produce knowledge about communities and societies around me. Um, this becomes an extremely important problem because this is very special to the kind of unique. So if you ask this question, what should my conditions be? What should I have before I can do physics? Then you might say, well, I should have studied some physics. I should have known the basic technique in physics, etc. needed to work in that domain. Now, in, the, in that similar uh, manner, when particularly in the context of social theory, producing theoretical accounts, producing narrative accounts about communities and how they work, et cetera, what should I then have? Is it just a kind of reading all the, uh, the books I read in sociology and anthropology and politi political science, et cetera? Would that be enough or is there something else? I think what Gopal Guru was also pointing to is the fact that what you actually need, what differentiates me as, a, as, a, as somebody who is studying a society and the members of that society is the, is the category of lived experience. And the category of lived experience is an interesting category. And there's much we discuss in the crack mirror about this. So I'm not going to talk about that. But um, in a very loose sense, it's also got to do with the fact how we actually misunderstand others, how we, uh, you know, if, 
it's it's highly probable that we misunderstand others more than we understand them and particularly in the context of marginalized classes people who are not in the kind of an academic power level as we are then you know we are the ones who are articulating the kinds of claims about society which they want which for, for whatever reasons and therefore many of the categorizations of the dominant over uh, the other so called marginalized oppressed you can look at all kinds of categories around it social categories will often be very problematical categories so whenever you look at terms of course like uneducated superstitious ignorant etc um it becomes a very important problem. i have seen this in public health initiatives for example when um, you know when i've gone with the doctors who have gone into tribal areas or some rural areas and the way they respond to the people on the ground there is something quite you know quite different i mean to me it's like that's not what a social scientist would actually be should be doing or uh, would be doing in an ideal sense uh, so there are these categories that we do because we don't share the lived experience we don't live the life that they do because the life they which the life that you live is what produces the conceptual categories in us even our understanding of conceptual categories in the social sciences are deeply influenced by the life we live by our lived experience and of course a common example i often use to talk about this is uh, of an architect who uh, very young you know bright architect was designing a house and a flat and he was telling something to the people who were you know for whom he was designing it and um, then uh, the woman in the house looked at the kitchen and asked him a simple question she said have you ever cooked or have you ever even boiled milk to make tea because it was a very beautifully designed kitchen but absolutely with no idea of the lived experience of having cooked which will then make you completely understand how you will intervene in that how you will design it what is your intervention and uh, intervention design uh, within that particular stage so it's, it's a very simple example but i think one can extend this extensively to seeing how um, this extends into the way we intervene in societies in way, way in which we take our knowledge systems into into communities and people and say this is what we think is good so one way out of this is to use what we call as uh, self descriptive categories um you can see this a lot now of course in the way the ideas of quote and quote west and east were produced and how we then now tend to reproduce our self descriptions and that's one particular way of talking about it but the in general i think it raises uh, you know far more complex questions particularly because the lived experiences the different experiences that characterize uh, for example class gender religion etc caste class gender religion in india is so complex that you very often need to come up with very different kinds of categories to make sense of it uh, largely you drawing upon social theory and social science as it is practiced still uh, 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 you know is very problematical because there are a lot of blind spots in that and i'll just focus on one blind spot to try and con con conclude in the next 10 15 minutes on one particular blind spot so we have an idea of what you know what this particular challenge is so the first point of course is uh, something which is again very close to my heart and i think something which uh, i'm sure many of you have um, you know talked about i did have a short discussion with stinidhi also about it and i'm sure this is a problem which you confront very often so i thought i will also focus a little just on this particular point when we talk about um, you know these kinds of challenges in talking about societies the 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 the, the problem this particular problem is the 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 academic production of knowledge that which legitimizes government actions for example that which is produced by institutions which have power of knowledge about societies and you know when i mean social theory i don't mean everybody has to do sociology social sciences etc i'm talking about whatever gets constituted as legitimate knowledge which allows the community let's say the public health community or government interventions to happen within societies that legitimized uh, in a set of uh, pieces of knowledge is what i'm talking about so um the first of all as i said a very important aspect of knowledge is the kind of categories you produce so uh, there is a particular fundamental problem about producing disciplines and uh, uh, disciplines is that they are based upon very specific concepts and categories that they use and that's what distinguishes them uh, to a great extent from various other disciplines each discipline is distinguished from another by the set of concepts and categories that they uh, that they use and you could legitimately ask a question what do these categories map to 
is the social reality a universal reality where each of these categories map correctly to the way the social reality is and another uh, way of asking therefore this question is what should we expect of uh, academics who are writing all this theory about what people are what they need what they should be doing etc what kind of uh, experiences what kind of training other than just the so called training of degrees and books and so on what kind of training would you require of them to produce some meaningful categories to talk about a society in this there is a we of course there are no that there are uh, the ways in which you do it i mean other than just being immersed within the training within a discipline you also do field work you go collect information about societies <clears throat> you talk to people uh, participant observation is a very important tool etc in all of this there is one particular uh, very important uh, you know a method and which also raises therefore a very uh, deep methodological problem which is the use of language because when i want to understand and study societies as an empirical phenomena i go talk to people i ask them what do you think about something what do you you know i i i use language as a tool to collect information and therefore when i'm using language as a tool to collect information i need to of course know their language um so you you know as social scientists we are going on to the field you learn their language you learn you stay with them you dress like them eat their food etc but you try and produce that knowledge about them through conversations and through language but you know in the larger indian uh, uh, social science context there are fundamental problems because language there is no one indian language in which these uh, larger uh, social reality is um, uh, present is presented to us there are multiple languages and even within one language there are multiple dialects and different kinds of implications and other kinds of uh, problems in the respect to the question of language and this may be true in general um in certain asian and african societies but not in the dominant west um which has produced much of this knowledge about the social sciences the problem the the reason why this becomes a problem in the indian context is that the social science categories which comes from this legitimized knowledge production this legitimized book of knowledge which are produced in the social sciences are dominantly in english and since they are dominantly in english we have to find ways to uh, figure out what how do they map to the social realities how do these kind of conceptual terms which come with their own cultural histories because language is culture you know in a fundamental sense and every phrase every conceptual term in language has this kind of baggage it comes with so when i produce so in other words the 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 challenge is the language of knowledge within the social sciences is de facto english but the language of experience of the people is de facto something else it can be kannada tamil malayalam hindi whatever else it is and given that how do i therefore try and make sense of this big problem between the use of uh, categories which are named in english to the way in which people understand themselves and their practices so one of the simplest ways in which people uh, engage with this problem is to look at translation and there are very you know typical thing is to say well um to look for equivalent words in different languages and that's one of the i think it's one of the most um you know well it doesn't make sense at all and i think it's not the right way to do this idea of this to look at these kinds of things in translations because um translation itself is a very very interesting domain there's a huge discipline called translation studies some of you may know about it and um i don't think it's a simple question of just saying well is there a word for this so let's say democracy is a let's say you want to think of some intervention as a democratic intervention within a particular village and then you go there and say i want to have this democratically produced and then you'll ask the people there what is it that what is the term used for democracy you know and if you do that you will find oh they don't have a word for democracy does it therefore it means they are not democratic i mean this is a this is an argument i've heard a million times about it. so many terms which are used um, uh, repeatedly in fact i had a very interesting conversation with srinidhi also about the term you was talking about the word respect um you know which are seen in languages very differently and that's a this is a genuine problems and for that the way you address these problems is to actually have a meaningful social theory which takes into account the question of translation very deeply into its practice now given that much of our social science practice have come from a very dominant uh, english based uh, 
you know, theoretical structure, this is not part of the kind of social science problem that we encounter. And therefore, um, I think this is something which um, we need to relook at in many, many different ways. And, uh, you know, it's a very big field. So if there are any questions, I can um, talk, uh, you know, maybe say something a little bit about it. Um, now, my, my argument is it's not just about the question of translation. It's about the question of language. It's about the situatedness of the people who study it. It's about various other reasons for which makes us, uh, which, which produces the fundamental inequities in the way we understand uh, communities and societies, and therefore in the way we intervene within their lives and engage with them, et cetera. I'll end with a very quick uh, connect to a very specific, uh, you know, the extension of this problem to medical knowledge. Now, I've been talking about the idea of social knowledge, of course, and the unique problems it uh, poses, and therefore the challenges we need to uh, take into account when we talk about meaningful social action intervening in societies, wanting to do something for people, et cetera. Now, in the case of medical knowledge, and therefore in the case of public health, for example, it uh, and not just the case of public health, but largely in the larger, larger context of medical knowledge, it's a very, very different species. It's a fantastically new, different kind of knowledge system that is present. Unlike a model of natural sciences, which is about the inanimate world, and the social sciences, which is about you know, human structures and autonomous beings and stuff, medical knowledge has got to do with the combination of something, something about being human, something about natural processes, okay? And uh, also with very, very interesting concepts such as health, disease, well-being, et cetera. It includes, therefore, a wide variety of knowledge from different domains, which are very often seen as, you know, contrary to each other or in tension with each other. Now, the the, the added problem to this is that medical knowledge and in the way in which we understand knowledge as reported by people are often very deeply related to human experiences, which means that, you know, uh, for example, you can see this in the COVID case too. There are people who would say it didn't, it doesn't affect them. There are people who would say, well, it affected me. I didn't feel the following. So there are no universal structures of experience that are, that are present for every member of a society. Okay, so of course, you, this is a, I'm sure when you have done ethics of public health, you have thought deeply about this question about, you know, arguments just greatest good, et cetera, et cetera, or to supporting the weakest and so on. But fundamentally, this is the challenge. When I have a subjective experience of my well-being, my well-being not defined in terms of medical parameter numbers, not in terms of the numbers which you are, which you are told today, right? Blood count and sugar and chloride or a stall, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of a subjective first person uh, level of uh, descriptions, how can you convert that into meaningful piece of knowledge? You, remember, you see, they realize that when we have questions of justification, first person justification doesn't make sense because justification by its very definition is something which is common and accessible, if not to all, at least to a larger majority. Now, and therefore, to reduce a large amount of medical experiences, which are first person, which are about what I feel and what my body experiences um, into pieces of knowledge is a fundamental challenge. And you need a different kind of a framework to make sense of it. And on top of it, of course, you have that um, in, especially with the context of medical sciences, unlike other kinds of knowledge systems, there are competing various varieties of multiple systems which are available. It's not just about Ayurveda, Unani, homeopathy, allopathy, etc. But there are all kinds of prescriptive practices which have to do with this idea of health and well-being, which are practiced within societies. Again, in the COVID narrative, you can see a lot of examples. Maybe we can talk about it during the, the question and answer session. So this therefore leads to this question of, is there a dominant knowledge system that I should use? Should I privilege one over the other? So we also saw this extensively again in the use of Ayurvedic medicines during COVID as against um, other kinds of medicines and so on. So what is it that, how do I then intervene within a social group, <coughs> you know, which may seem to be following certain kinds of um, non-dominant medical practice, which I may not know anything about. And I'm going in, as an intervention, and I have uh, various kinds of uh, initiatives which I want to suggest um, based on certain ideas of uh, medical histories that I have. And then I encounter a world of people 
whose uh, narratives are different, whose conceptual worlds are different, whose uh, ways in which they understand uh, the medical systems are different. What do we do? How do we do? How do we deal with this uh, various um, engagement? And in the case of public health, of course, there are, um, you know, one has to see where their conceptual categories are drawn from, dominantly from, whether it is, it's not just a dominant medical community, there's also a dominant state role within the way these are produced. So one has to then ask, uh, what, is the, what is the language of the state, you know, the larger government and the state? What is the language of the state? And why does it use certain categories? Why does it do certain interventions in the way it does. Now, in saying all this, I'm not critiquing public health initiatives nor medical initiatives. All I'm trying to say is um, within the larger question that we are concerned about in describing and mapping societies and giving you know, examples to people of how we should intervene and create narratives of what is meant by progress, what is meant by health, um, et cetera, we are drawing upon certain kinds of, you know, our own standpoints, our own privileged positions from which we are able to talk about what is good for others. Um, some, in some cases, there are very good reasons for you to know to be in that position, right? And I think medical science again gives us good examples of that. But in many cases, that need not be the case. And the question here, as anybody who engages with society, whether you are philanthropists, you are uh, public health specialists, or even the larger medical communities, or people who want to say they want to build roads or introduce 5G or 6G technology for the people, et cetera, any such intervention in society raises certain fundamental ethical questions because you are engaging with society, making some impact on community of people who live. Now, the larger question is not whether what we do is right or wrong. The larger question is, what is our training? What is it that we are supposed to do? What is it that we are supposed to think about and experience in order to meaningfully make some changes, in order to recognize that we, we are ethically, morally right in suggesting certain things, you know? And historically the question of knowledge which has always been um, divorced from the idea of uh, ethics and morality in the natural sciences cannot be transplanted into the question of the social sciences and that there are much greater uh, deeper problems with that and um, you know what i have done so far is just to give you as i said a very small um, insight into one particular aspect of one small strain, 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 i mean a strand of an argument to suggest and show how this might be part of the challenges you may face in your own work, and the, particularly the question about language and intervening within societies uh, which are not like us. Thank you so much.